nothing like jumping around to relax. How do you feel tonight? Oh, oh shut up, you <laughs> Oh, I thought he was fabulous. I thought he was. I thought he had a, a wonderful uh, ability to uh, improvise, uh, to to make the moment come alive, even when there wasn't much going on. <laughs> what do you do for a living, Julie? I'm a typist. A typist mm -hmm. at an insurance broker, yeah. at a solicitor's office, yeah. at uh, Coles and Garrard, the famous people who make wonderful sunglasses. No. <laughs> no. Oh, you might be with Massey Ferguson, the people who make wonderful tractors. You're not by any chance with red milking machines, are you? No. Is it possible, one says to oneself, that you're with custom carpets? No. I know, the fridge right dairy vat people. No. You're, you're at the Drew and Butterfat factory. Oh, well, I've guessed as much as I can and got rid of a few debts. Uh, and the word had got around that there was this genius in Melbourne. So meeting him, uh, a couple of years later, was like meeting royalty. Oh, sire, what ails? I'm, I'm crooking me royal guts. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't the chicken, it was the, the fish I ate. Surgeon! No, it was a sturgeon. It was incredible to watch him two minutes before showtime. Nobody could go near him. He just wanted to be on his own, puffing that cigarette, concentrating. And whatever nerves he may have had, and they were surely there, he had that wonderful ability to crush them right under. As soon as he walked out, the studio was his. Good evening. Don't you hate that commercial? Yesterday I wasn't feeling very well. And I couldn't play with Sharon. I couldn't play with my teddy bear. But last night, Mummy gave me a chocolate. Did she ever? <laughs> Bang! Graham was irreverent and liked to kick holy cows and uh, do things that other people didn't do. And if there was something wrong, he wouldn't try and cover it up. He'd bring it out and say, look, that's ridiculous, blah, 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 and, and then get on with the show. And that's, that's very healthy. He was performing to the mums and dads in their own front room. One, two, three. Nobody's ever done it the way he's he did it, and I believe could probably still do it if he wanted to. He was, by some strange osmosis, linked to the audience through the camera. I'll do it again. Very good, and thank you very much for supporting our show, watching it, because you've helped us on the surveys, and apparently you want to continue watching it. We're very happy to to have you. Wasn't that nice what I said then? <laughs> I love you, viewer. I think he was born for television and he and television uh, just met at the right time. An animal lover who thought he'd bred a one-eyed cat discovered that it was entering the room backwards. <laughs> I was just testing her mouthwash, actually. <laughs> Nothing could be more simple than an Arnott's Sayo biscuit, and yet everybody loves them just for that reason. You can do so much with them. It's like a foundation for an exciting meal. An Arnott's Sayo. Not only that, you can make vanilla slices. Have you seen that commercial? Mm. <laughs> nice homemade vanilla slice made out of two Sayo biscuits. Now about that? It sounds like dysentery, doesn't it? <laughs> I made them out of Sayo Biscuit. I think I'd rather commit Harry Carey than eat a vanilla slice. Graham treated television with the contempt it deserves. I remember writing that when I used to review his performance as a television critic. 
Uh, people are awed, deferential to television. They view it as though viewing the high altar in a church. Anyone on television is special. Graham subverted and inverted that. He took the piss out of the medium. I don't have to eat it uh, tonight, do it. I do have to. <laughs> oh, that's good, because I love it. <laughs> What flavour have we got tonight? Blueberry. <laughs> Those little black things. Yuck. <laughs> no, it's good though. It's good. It's Peter's real fruit yogurt. And it tastes delicious. Mmm. <laughs> he showed early in the piece that live television can be interesting when it's boring. If it's a night when it's not happening for him, he would, he'd let everyone know that he knew it wasn't working. And the very fact that things weren't happening as they should have done, he made something out of that. Over the last couple of weeks, there have been many mentions of where I might go. Um, there have been... <laughs> there have been rumours about Channel O and Channel 7, Channel 2 even, but these are completely untrue. And the money that I'm being paid for this guest appearance tonight, I'm very happy about. <laughs> Channel O, of course, they came up with a very, very big offer, but I... I never thought that there was anything that Graham didn't do on television that wasn't funny. I just thought that everything he did ha had this wonderful sense of, of the ridiculous and total irreverence. But there is another little trick with Thorn Atlas, another very handy thing you can do. Oh, that was terribly handy. Another little handy thing you can do. You can have a quick snack. A small barbecue at any time of the night. Sausages, anything at all. You might think that this set is especially... Oh. Well, they did. The Russians found two prehistoric lizards that had been in the ice for 5,000 years. And by warming them up, they started to run around, brought them back to life. I was just thinking, can you imagine two lizards waking up after 5,000 years. <laughs> hey, Mildred. Look at the time. What are we going to tell your old man? Ask for, insist on wonderful Tongala condensed milk. Yes. Take Toddy's advice, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Insist on Tongala reduced cream, because it's good stuff. In fact, looking back, I think the IMT body of work is, I think, absolutely amazing. And it's not until you have the, uh, the opportunity, I suppose, in which I've been privileged to have, to actually look at hours of that work. If you look, you see the people from Perry play on the the man is a, a consummate um, teller of jokes. He's a consummate singer. He's a fantastic dancer. You see him coming out and he, he dances as, as beautifully as Danny Kay could dance. And you look back at that work and there's a... a while he was the king and uh, the most famous of all our comic talents, in, certainly in my generation, he was, always, he was also absolutely fantastic at what he did. I think the most important thing about IMT was the next day because it became the topic of conversation. Did you see, did you see IMT last night? What about that thing that Graham did with the alka -Seltzer? You know, and that, that's why IMT was such a household thing because everyone watched it and it became part of your life, became part of your household, your family. I can explain everything. There's nothing else. Isn't there? Born? Of course I was born. What do you think? I was incubated or something. Where were you born? In bed. No, whereabouts? Oh, next to Mum. 
what state? Naked. Where do you come from, Graham? Well, I was born in California. <laughs> Where are you? Yes. Which part? All of them. I see. <laughs> and where were you born? In bed. <laughs> no whereabouts. Next to mum. <laughs> no, in what state? Naked. Oh. <laughs> Dale said to me one night, after about four or five weeks, he said, it's not firing, is it, Dave? You know. I said, no. He said, what do you reckon? I said, oh, I don't know. Why don't we bugger around more, you know? And he said, Let's, he said, instead of putting the game first and comedy second, let's reverse it. Let's put comedy first and put the game second. Really? Take them off, take them off. I beg your pardon? Take them off. Oh, all right. Take them off. <laughs> As a character actor, he had a lot to offer. He had a lot of style and flair. He could be very funny, he could get the most out of every line, and yet he was never obvious, you know, he didn't, um, he didn't overplay. But the reason why I wanted uh, Graham was that I'd seen him in Don's party and he, was, he's, he is a terrific actor. I mean, we, we all sort of up until that time knew him as this um, larrikin on, on television, uh, but his, his comedy timing and, and that sort of thing is just absolutely superlative. I always play hopeless badly dressed characters. If they ever make a film of, the, of, of Bernard King's life, I'll be asked to play it. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, if, Mac oh, in Don's part, he was a I hopeless little... I can't say the word. He was, <laughs> no, he was a bit of a T-U-R-D. <laughs> And then, and then Harry in The Odd Angry Shot, he was hopeless. Ted in The Club is uh, manic. Uh, uh, he's a failure in life. Really makes I think that's why I was chosen. <laughs> <laughs> this, this funny little fat bloke with eyes hanging out. <laughs> and a greasy head. And a greasy head comes onto the screen. It's, it, it, try and miss it if you can. <laughs> Do you think you'll get mail as a result of this? Wonderful fan mail, uh, hot, passionate, steaming letters? Only from deviates, I think. <laughs> Then what's new? <laughs> it's not that I was naive, but I just couldn't believe that you could say these things on television. Graham, you are a bit of a knocker, knocker lately. Won't you say one positive thing about someone before the Christmas break? All right, I will. You are a Positive. We were planning on being around next year, were we? <laughs> I guess he is slightly eccentric. Uh, I, I suppose after so many years of, co of comedy, you get a bit quirky, but Hello, it was also man. a sight gag. <laughs> I've got a glandular <laughs> Isn't that revolting? <laughs> I knew Sir Frank too, of course. <laughs> Would you do it again for us in close-up? I don't think I'd do that. <laughs> oh, hang on. Yeah, I'll probably do it. No, I'd do that. <laughs> Call me gross if you want to. <laughs> Shut up! Five, <laughs> four, three, <laughs> two. <laughs> oh, there you are. the reflex test. That hurt a little bit. No, no, no right. reflex. It's funny, isn't it? Let's try this one. Oh. Where did it start? I mean, I mean, obviously you were in, born. I uh, was born in Balaclava. Went to school at Caulfield Central. There's my Aunt Helen. That's me in the front. And there's my mum to the right. There's me holding a little, I'm marching yeah. and concentrating with the tongue stuck in, which I still do in the corner of the mouth. Then I went to Melbourne High School 
And then, when I left school, I applied for a job at 3UZ, didn't get it. Then they, 3UZ rang me and said the job I'd applied for wasn't available, but there was another one in the record library, which meant as the records came out of the studio, I would file them. I was about 16 or 17, and I was at 3UZ um, trying to get a song. I was working in a show, and in those days there was no tape, no cassette tape, and you had to listen over and over and over and over and over to a record to learn the songs. And Graham was a record boy there. And um, he was in charge of bringing in the records and playing for us. And I remembered him because he was quite a cheeky person. Then a couple of years after that, he started working with Nicky. If it wasn't for uh, the late Clifford Nichols Witter, I certainly wouldn't be here today. That was my big break yeah. uh, in the business. I was straight man to him. And sometimes during the week I used to tap into the 3UZ feed and listen to he and Nicky. But I, I wasn't really... I was aware that I was listening to somebody who was pretty different. We were both working in Melbourne radio at different stations. Uh, Graham at 3UZ, the greater 3UZ, and me at 3XY, the quality station and we were both aware of each other. We had this thing, Graham used to park his car uh, beyond 3XY. 3XY used to be in the Princess Theatre building and 3UZ was around the corner in Melbourne, uh, in Burke Street. And we'd pass each other in the street, Graham would verify this, and never say hello to each other. This went on for a couple of months. Then eventually, I think it was myself who said, look, this is ridiculous, we know each other, how do you do in the whole thing? Graham would come around from 3UZ and we'd have a couple of beers together, so we were friends and buddies before television began. I guess we're talking about 1955, 56, when we first got to know each other. Next time I saw him, um, it was just after GTV9 had opened up and uh, I was doing the pyjama game. And on the Sunday, they had a telethon. And in those days, telethons lasted six hours, <laughs> not 24 hours like they did later on. And I remember Norm Spencer coming up behind me and saying, see that young guy over there? And I said, oh, yeah, that's Graham from 3UZ. He said, well, we've been trying out all the radio announcers in Melbourne. We're starting a new show called In Melbourne Tonight. And he said, and he's going to be the one. So I think I knew before Graham that he had it. A show for you that is so happy and bright With gaiety and music and such a happy crowd We will do our best to keep you laughing out loud In Melbourne tonight It reminds me of uh, the first time I went into Norm Spencer's office I went in to see Norm Spencer for a job And typical of Norm, he jobbed me We were both very close to our mothers In Graham's case, of course um, it's well documented that he came from a uh, mother and father who divorced. He spent a lot of time with his beloved grandma. When IMT first began, his television money and his radio money was paid in one package. There was a deal that Channel 9 had done with 3UZ. And Graham came home with his first combined pay envelope, and it contained £80, which I suppose today would be the equivalent maybe of $1,000 or $1,200 or whatever. And his grandmother said, that is far too much, you must take some back. And she meant it. One's nearly got a quarter of a potato in it. <laughs> and they've got the hide to charge 20 cents. Now, isn't that terrible? See, if you mashed all that down, that'd only be the tiniest, tiny... I'll do it, I'll do it. <laughs> no, I just want to show you something. I love coal van, they, they'll love me for this. <laughs> I'm a hit with the drive-in people. <laughs> Oh, oh, yes. Now, you watch this. Now, that looks a lot. But you watch. I'm in the mood to lose them all tonight. <laughs> so here's this kid doing IMT, treating the medium with the contempt it deserved, 
And that was Graham's great gift. He, he wasn't awed by television. He wasn't deferential to the medium. He gave her the finger. And uh, that, that audacity, that cheek, was so exhilarating. And it gave Graham a power on the screen that I don't think anyone else began to emulate. Would you really burn down this modern village to smoke out Queen Baldessia? <laughs> yes. Then stay your friend. <laughs> and yours. <laughs> what? Stay your evil hand. Besides, it is a bit evil. <laughs> and if it wasn't a really good script, there was often some very funny costume devised because that would sort of help it a little bit and if that failed Graham usually made me laugh I'd go into hysterics the audience would go into hysterics everyone would laugh and you know that'd be about the way it went and usually they were very funny sketches I'm sorry about that Praticus <laughs> oh a lot of period sketches because they look good You've got good costumes, you see, and television is a, a, a visual medium. It must look good. If a thing looks good, it appeals to the eye, to the people either in the studios, because we've always had a live audience, or the people at home. I often appeared in uh, these historical sketches as a page boy, and uh, with a flourish of trumpets and wearing a toga or whatever, I'd be introducing Henry VIII or Nero or whatever Graham's character was. Uh, but on one occasion, Graham decided to let me suffer even more than usual and left me in front of the camera to ad-lib uh, indefinitely. And I think he just walked away from the sketch and thought, well, Philip, you can, you can die on your own. Renounce my faith! Never, never! I belong to the true faith, the only faith. The faith of our fathers. Renounce my faith. You must be joking. I would never renounce my faith in a thousand years. <laughs> I, I serve, I belong to the true faith. My faith is true faith. The faith of all true Christians. Renounce my faith. I tell you, if there's nothing on the next page, I... I shut up! Two headaches are better than one, so comedy writer Hugh Stuck in Jack Brown work as a team. When it's written, the sketch faces its severest critics, the comedians, at their first rehearsal. Help! Help! Help me! Pulse has stopped! Your pulse isn't stopped. That's your watch. <laughs> How's that? Yeah, that's all right. We prefer something funny. <laughs> it goes with the rest of the script. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Go on with the opera. We decided, let's do a custard pie sketch. I mean, it was... God, real knock about it. We knew... It we knew it was vaudeville and knockabout, and we involved as many of the Channel 9 personalities as we could in it. We had Evie Hayes and Jack Little and apparently everybody that could fit into it, and, and it, was, it was custard pies for everybody, and the, the gag was that it missed Graham, went all the way through and missed Graham. And my idea was if is if you're going to hit someone with a custard pie you've got to have a reason for doing it you don't just hit them anyway it worked incredibly well but one of the things i remember we planted a guy in the audience in the studio audience who was apparently sound asleep and graham noticed him took a pie up and whacked hit him with it really hard but it splattered practically everybody in the audience. I mean, it, the whole sketch got a huge laugh. The joke backfired a bit when Graham told me the next day that Channel 9 had had to pay everybody's dry cleaning bill. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry there is cream from the front row right back to the back. <laughs> well, that was a pretty messy one. Everyone got a pie. Of course, I can't get a... I can't get a pie because I'm the comp here and I have to get dressed like... Want a bet? Rosie, no. <laughs> Well, <laughs> yes, straight <laughs> to the 
a party. For that anytime, anywhere cool drink, reach for Marchand's Ring Thing bottle or can. The only soft drinks in the world that are sparkle like a Yes, Martins have the best soft drinks in the easiest to open bottles and cans. The secret, of course, is Martins' exclusive ring thing. Ring and thing. And, of course, you know it makes bottle openers old-fashioned. And now, my very good friend, Mr Graham Kennedy, is going to demonstrate... Can I do it with a can? Of course you can do it with a can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miss Willing. Take hold of the ring thing, like this, and then simply pull. Pull, lift... lift. And it's, it's off. off. Now. Of course, and then you enjoy, this is the best part, yes. you enjoy Marchant's sparkle-arkle-arkling lemonade. <laughs> <laughs> now, hang on. I think you we, did that, I think we got a dud one there. <laughs> Here we are. Here's a definite. Pull, lift, pour. That's it. You've done it. That look. It's macroculture. <laughs> it's dead. Now, now listen, this I've got, is wrong. They've You've been gagging it. there. Now, been, look, excuse me. Hey, now, just, just a now, minute. But look, Wait for it's this. got a bit of lemon and it's plain thing in it. Here we are. Oh, no, this, this is, is better. shocking. <laughs> <laughs> that's not... That's utter, utter, luddling. That's... <laughs> <laughs> I hate to think of that was quite candidly. That's Mill. Oh. I'll do a proper one, all right. Well, I've got to pour that out. Now you'll be able to tell the difference because this is the genuine. That was funny. Mike thought of that too. Oh, he's great, that boy. Graham would rehearse the script absolutely perfectly and the account executive and the agency rep from the um, particular agency would clap their hands and say, that's fantastic. They'd go to the pub and then, of course, on the night, Graham would do whatever he wanted to do. I always carry this with me, you know, because you never... Oh, good. Yeah. It won't fit through the hole. <laughs> Why don't you go first yes. and then try? Oh, that's a good idea. You're right? Yep. No. Well, well, I have to put it over OK, here. right, right. Well, just... just <laughs> you know, you never know when those nasty flies and monkeys... <laughs> What have you done? I'm, I'm, I've got to move the big uh, can of uh, pussy because of the next act. Well, can which... I help you? No, no, just go ahead and do that. Where do you have to stick it? <laughs> over there, over there. Well, get the cross there. Well, I'll yeah, talk about protecting. Right. Yeah. Okay. I won't disturb you, mate. Okay, right. Go ahead and do right. the thing. You know. As I was saying, I always carry Johnson's protector because you never know when flies and mossies will strike, particularly. He used to become insanely angry with ad agencies who thought that he could, you know, do an ad lib 60 second commercial by them handing him a script an hour before he went on because he used to demand, which was a great idea, that he had two full working days for every ad lib script so that he could practice it. And he would, I know, do it in front of a mirror 50 different ways till he got it right. And that was his great skill, very professional. Was that little bit meant to be humorous at all? <laughs> Because I've got a hot flash for you. <laughs> Graham, I think you need to buy the Women's Weekly to find the answer to that. All oh, right. Well, I'll get my copy shortly. I, w I would do their commercials, you know, if they arrive 72 hours uh, before showtime. But when they tell it sit down on the same day, I refuse. <laughs> well, let me tell you, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I'd always wanted to know what would happen if we put a, a, a flash pot inside a large jelly. And I actually went out to the car park and tested it. And it was re really sensational because the jelly went everywhere. So we had this commercial, I think it was for Ronson something or other. And Graham was really looking forward to this jelly demonstration. And I saw him just before the show, and he was getting into a brand new suit. And his suits were made in those days by Chris Anastasius in Collins Street, and they were huge, hugely expensive. And it was a brand new one. And I said, Graham, you know what's going to happen later tonight? And he said, no, it's fine. I thought, OK. So we get to the commercial, and I suddenly realised why he didn't worry about his suit. Now, I don't see why I have to go through life being blown up and things <laughs> dropped on me. I reckon the fellow who thought of it should sit here. <laughs> And he should be subject. Mike McCall Jones, this is my writer, Mike McCall Jones, ladies and gentlemen. Come on.
you didn't know. <laughs> I want you to sit in real close, Mike. That's it. A little over this way, I think. I want you to stare at that jelly. Something funny is going to happen. <laughs> Hang on, just stay there. Don't. If you want to say something funny, it's all right. Mm. <laughs> How are you, Mike? Um, pretty Pretty good. <laughs> Don't faint. Mike, Mike has a... Mike sometimes faints. <laughs> at hospitals and things, you know. He can smell dead hole and go right off into the... <laughs> you ready, Mike? Mm. This is going to be very funny. Mm. <laughs> Who thought of it, Mike? Mm. <laughs> when I count three, it's got to go up. Mm. You ready, Mike? Mm -hmm. One. Two. You ready, Liz? Three. <laughs> hey, that's funny, Mike. <laughs> well, I wish to make a statement, ladies and gentlemen. Royal Merton shoes are rotten. That was new, I think, to, to Australian television in those days, that, you know, being naughty about the product was something that was, you know, you didn't do for, your, for absolute fear. But Graham got to that and it was superb. Hate them. <laughs> I pick, I pick on. <laughs> Brown Merton 707s are fabulous shoes. Brown Merton 707s give you style. Hate them. <laughs> That's not in it. <laughs> now say something nice. Raoul Merton shoes are really very nice. That's right. Raoul it's Mer only me that hates them. Don't you not? Raoul Merton 707s cost, as I say, cost you only 99 and 11. <laughs> So if you pop along to your, to your local... <laughs> Lots of stuff was done on Grog, of course, and uh, on, on my drinking. Graham will, uh, will admit to the fact that, in reality, um, Graham drank just as much, if not more, than I. I always thought that they should have done the road to pictures with, with Bert and Graham. I think they would have been wonderful because they had that same sort of uh, connection. Uh, Bert, of course, is a, a brilliant comic talent as well, but the way they just worked off each other in those early days was fantastic. Get up! I think that they were soulmates. I, they were both of the same generation. They both had come up through radio as kids, so they had that code that married couples have or, or people from a family have, you know, where you can sort of say something in rhyming slang or you can just do a sideways look. And that's what Bert and Graham had. And it was a joy to watch. The thing that he had going for him with Bert was that Bert is also very funny. And so Bert, neither of them tried to be the other one. They were like two people heading down the same road, sort of holding hands. And I, I think it was a really right. fabulous partnership. Now, Martin, fabulous. You want to know more? They were amazing days. And when you replay the footage, they're still amazing. Still amazing. Hello, daughter. <laughs> Where did you go to school in Holland? In Adam stood out of it. In what? Adam Adam stood out of it. In what? Adam Adam stood out of it. Did you like school? Yeah, Adam Adam. At school, did you did you learn a story which we learn over here about the little the little Dutch boy who 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 saved millions of people? How did he do it with that? Remember the little boy who put his finger in the dike? <laughs> Here's your bricky. Blister and blood oranges, Joyce. What's this? 
What does it look like? The Wilsons came together from one of those things we took out of the newspaper. I can't remember the actual detail of it, but it was about two old pensioners and uh, they had a canary and there was something to do with the fact that I think it was a very old canary and we did a blackout where they had bought the canary a birthday present and it ended up being a cat and you know the finish of the sketch was um, the cat in the birdcage with feathers around it. Darn. Graham fell in love with the character at the time that they'd um, rehearsed it and Johnny Ladd had fixed up a wig for him and Rosie had got her wig on and they'd found all the gear for it. They loved the character and he felt great doing it so they called Freddie in and said how about writing a sketch? My <laughs> <laughs> god that prune juice packs a wallop. <laughs> Originally when the Wilsons was done, it used to be done after the show. We'd stay back after the show, and the audience had gone, and then we'd do the Wilsons. This is going back a bit, because Graham very kindly, when he'd finished all the IMTs, sent me his wigs, which is a lovely pressy. That, that was one of the George Wilsons, you see, with the eyebrows attached there. So you came down, you hadn't got to bother about any other makeup. The new star blankets have got control knobs. <laughs> Control knob? Yes. One for the husband and one for the wife. Oh, it'd, it'd take more than a knob to control me and me. Goodbye, <laughs> <laughs> George. You're not. <laughs> If you're not going to keep me warm in my old age, you'll get nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> Back in that time, uh, Channel 9 Melbourne had a, a singing chorus of 15 or 16 people, a, a ballet of 15 or 16, a staff orchestra with strings on a couple of nights a week, which was a big deal then, perhaps not now. It was just a, a feeling of being a, a repertory company. And so you, you learned pretty quickly that you had to do everything. And once again, Graham was probably the first person who learned that lesson. Baby, you son of a gun! Ah, oh, last time I had an audience that was this small, I was at confession. Ah, and I'm not even a Catholic. But seriously, I love food. I was at a restaurant the other night, and the waiter brought me a bowl of soup and had a fly in it. I said, waiter, what's that fly doing in my soup? And he said, the breaststroke. <laughs> Tell you what, Can I have the money for the milk? The boss will be mad, and I'm getting the wind up. Melvin, did you? I'm glad you said wind. Did you hear the story about the farmer who was milking a cow in the hurricane? The wind was so strong it blew the cow away. It left the farmer holding the bag. <laughs> <laughs> These are the jokes, sweetheart. Well, now, what do you think about the house, Melvin? I mean, this is where I came to get away from show business. <laughs> The opening when your heart beats like a drum The closing when the customers won't come <laughs> What? A mouse! A mouse! Never mind about the mouse, Mrs. Murphy, you forget that we have the new, the latest 
Anti-mice device made in Germany. Have you seen the new improved Rouse Mouse Melvin? It's a humdinger. This is the great invincible German mouse trap. Der Rouse Mouse. This trap just doesn't trap the mouse, no. It catches it in crossfire. <laughs> it, <laughs> it replaces the old model. You're listening, I have you shot. It replaces the old model. This one will take prisoners. And believe me, it has ways of making them squeak. <laughs> no mouse will dare escape from the new improved rust mouse. They know that we have their relatives back at the factory. <laughs> you will buy a Rouse Mouse Melbourne and you will like the Rouse Mouse and your mouse will like the Mice Rouse. The Mouse Mouse Rouse. <laughs> your Mouse Mice will. Yes. Achtung! And in case of large numbers of mice, in, in case of danger of mass mouse attacks, it comes equipped with this special device. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Let's hear it for the boys in the band. Well, Melvin, that's that's about it, Melvin, baby. Is there anything else I can do? All I want is the money for the milk. Did you hear that? All he wants is the money for the milk. All he wants is the money for the milk. Now I'm going to suggest that if you are a commercial television station, that you shove something in here now. We loved Rover and Rover was a great dog. He had to bring Rover into the station for the PAL commercials. Now this night, I the commercial was, was quite late in the show. And Dad was always thinking, you know, poor old thing, you know, he loves his food and he hasn't had anything to eat, so won't hurt, I'll just give him a little bit. I won't uh, keep him in suspense a moment longer. Rover, come on. Come on. You may eat. <laughs> yes, you can. Oh, I did it the wrong way, it's confused. Sit. You may eat. Uh, <laughs> Rover boy, this is delicious here. This is pal dog food. <laughs> Rover? Oh, he's... <laughs> I said to Barney, have you paid for this dog? to do this? No. It just seemed like a good idea. I said, the doctor be paid. He said, how would you do that? I said, I'll think about it. So, the man who was wanting Uncle Ben's at, in those days was a very charming man called Henry Nowick, Dr. Henry Nowick. And I phoned him up one day come on, come on, come on. and I said, Henry, 
Rover's really sick. I don't think he can go on. Graham's very worried. He said, what's the problem? I said, well, you know, he can't go on. What do you think we could do to make it well? I said, I think if we paid him, he would regain his appetite and eat the dog food and would be well again. Cut along, I mean, he was actually shocked. Cut a long story short, Rover got five, in those days, $500 a week. It's, uh, excuse me, uh, do you mind dogs in here? I certainly do mind dogs in here. Good, here, mind this one for me, will you? Thank you. <laughs> Now, we'll try word association. Word I'm going to give you some words, and when I say the word, I want you to give me the first thing that comes into your mind. Uh-huh. All right. First Thir thing. Just Straight first away. Thing. Right. Uh-huh. 39, and I'm doing psychiatry with an ostrich. <laughs> I've been doing um, the ostrich on the, the children's word. program, the next word and um, I'm not sure uh, whose idea it was, but someone suggested that we do uh, a spot with Aussie on, on IMT. And uh, the thing that impressed me about that was that he stepped back and played straight man to the ostrich, which I didn't expect. Um, and it was a lot of fun. You know, these might, this is like the ink blot test. You've heard of the ink blot test? Oh, yeah, I saw a few on the floor outside. <laughs> yes, well, th these, these will give me some idea of, 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 you know, of what you're thinking and what's depressing you. Oh, really? They'll be very it's simple. They're just little things, you know. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, good, good. Oh, yeah, yeah, sex, 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 yeah, sex, sex, yeah, oh, yeah, sex. Here's another simple picture. Now, you tell me what, what you think of this. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, sex, oh, yes, yeah, sex, sex, oh, yeah, sex, sex, yeah. Settle down, oh, yeah. settle down. Oh, oh, yeah. Set, just hang on. Sex, you say? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Oh, yes, no doubt about that. Oh, yes, definitely. Yes, 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 definitely. Here's another simple picture. <gasps> oh, that's him. Oh, sex, sex. Oh, yes. Oh, Ozzy. Oh, yeah. Oh, Ozzy, yes. I am shocked. You are depraved, disgustingly crude. You're obviously a pervert. How could you say something like that about me? You're the one who's drawing all the dirty pictures. <laughs> 2,434 performance. It's a lot of performance. That's ten and a half years. Nearly 11 years of nightly television. It's a long time, friends. And it proves one thing. I'm brilliant. Congratulations, Mr. Kennedy. Your obvious popularity makes me tongue-tied. Thank you very much, Mr. Edwards. And I would like to thank me for being a grand little performer. I beg your pardon? <laughs> Ron Kennedy. I'm so thrilled. Um, thank you very much, and I, I'm very touched. Ladies and gentlemen, the 1978 Gold Logie winner is Graham Kennedy. I would very much like to thank me <laughs> for having faith in the Reg Grundy organization. Good evening. How come with a performance like that and all we saw from you last year, you didn't get a logie? Oh, how observant of you, mate. <laughs> well, I, you know, it was, you noticed that too. it was quick, but I just caught it. I thought Graham did not get a logie. <laughs> yeah, I think it's uh, become a little political. You know, I really think you can get them if you want them. I, 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 know, I know for a fact that one of our afternoon compares some years ago, uh, threatened not to renew his contract unless he got a logie. Well, they got one for him. They really did, and he continued with his contract. You can get him. The funny thing was, he got it, and it was everybody clapped and said, oh, wonderful, wonderful, Fred. And uh, there was no category for you to vote for him. He couldn't have won it anyway. That's tantamount to Bert Newton saying, uh, I won't compare the show anymore unless I get a logie. <laughs> Now, that mightn't have happened, but don't forget what Bert won it for. There was no category to vote for Bert. He could have only won it for IMT. He didn't win that. He won one for special events or something. Yeah. Mm. So sadly, I'm afraid the 
dear old Logie Award, which started off, honestly, I think perhaps it's a bit like the magazine now, 90% fiction. I think you all know uh, in what esteem I hold this um, <laughs> award, and I'm not sure that I can mention it. I think it might be still, still sub judice, I'm not sure. <laughs> I wanted to do a game show, I'd never done a game show, and I heard some dressing room gossip. I think Don Lane was talking to Jimmy Hannon, we might have been doing something called Celebrity Squares. Uh, and they said, Grundy, Grundy's have got this thing, it's terrific, it's the American match game. Uh, we don't know what they're going to call it over here. So I thought, well, if Don and Jim are in, I'll just check this out. So, Tony Connolly, uh, who was producing Celebrity, he did all the Grundy shows, I think, uh, was also doing Celebrity Squares, and I said, T Tony, tell me about uh, the match game. So he did. And uh, I wanted to do it. Cyril said... Mm. <laughs> he always starts like that. Cyril said, oh, my friend Derek... <laughs> my friend Derek is so manly. He picks his teeth with blanks. Derek. Derek was very butch. <laughs> so <laughs> I think you got Stuart on Jack the line. Jack <laughs> Wouldn't that be butch? <laughs> so, I think I'll have a got me teeth. <laughs> we rehearsed Blankety Blanks for weeks before we actually did the show because Graham's a perfectionist and not only did he want the show to work really well, he wanted the other characters who were going to be working with him to work really well with him. When I first met my wife, you know, she was actually, <laughs> she was looking in a pawnbroker's shop window and she was picking her teeth. Wash she? Then she went in and bought them. I see. <laughs> so uh, Graham had the opportunity to choose who the people would be Stuart, on the panel Stuart and there Ragsdorf. were a number of them that he used constantly. Uh, Stuart Wagstaff was one and Ugly Dave That's Gray was another and, and myself. If he didn't like you, you didn't get on the show. When they did the initial pilot, I was invited to be on the panel and I said yes and I did it and I stayed on it for the entire two-year run of it. And it was like going to a party every night. It was great fun. <laughs> oh, it's the most peculiar feeling. Graham. <laughs> Graham? Yes? Cable for you. Oh, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Stuart, you must never do that again. <laughs> I got a phone call from Graham. And he said, Dave, he said, I'm doing a pilot for a brand new show called Blankety Blanks, and I'd love you to be a part of it. I said, oh, no, I'm acting now. He said, I know I've seen you. That's why I'm making this phone call. But he also used to have wonderful fun with the contestants, and they would absolutely adore it because that was the talent he had. Then he proceeded to eat his... Um... <laughs> <laughs> His what? Cooking. Cooking. I was never a great um, an enthusiastic viewer of things like blankety blanks. It wasn't my sort of a program. But even now, if I see it on cable. I'm fascinated by the way he jumps around and controls that space. Almost like Geoffrey Robinson doing a hypothetical. And the same sort of shrewd intelligence as a play. This Blake is very, very smart. Yes, thank you. And welcome to the cleanest show on television. <laughs> no? The second cleanest show on? No. Uh, yes, it's dirty time again. <laughs> We have a nork, a body, and a boo. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> now, a Peter Tapano, I don't think has any of those. I just have a feeling she may have. I, I mean, she has got a full set of everything. <laughs> oh, no. 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 Oh, take it back. You can't sit down and think of gimmicks. No, they that. just happen, you know? Like when Graham did Cyril. Just one night he said, Cyril said, mm, you know, because it conjured up. A gay guy, Cyril, you know, like Bruce, you know. 
I've just defended thousands of Cyrils and Bruce's now. But um, he, he just did it one night and it got a laugh. So once a week he'd do a Cyril question. And, and the Dick business that I started... Dick was dining at the restaurant. Dick was. Was Dick ever. Clever Dick. Okay. Yes. <laughs> How tall was Dick? Oh, Dick's about six foot seven. Big Dick. <laughs> <laughs> he always used to bring his microphone down to me and then pucker up and I'd pucker up and the two of us would do this really elaborate slobbery kiss on camera. Oh, garlic. <laughs> but of course, he was a scrupulous person and was terrified of breathing on me, as indeed I was, so the two of us would fake it enormously. Do you mind me kissing you after just having kissed Abigail? You <laughs> No, I, that sounded awful. What I meant was, are you, are you jealous? Oh, no, I can't wait to be kissed by you. That'll be a hundred dollars. He came in as the star, uh, as himself, in Kingswood Country, a whole episode written around Graham. And the idea was that Graham was coming to visit our house. You must be Mrs. Bullpit. Yeah. How do you do, Mr. Kennedy? <laughs> and in fact, he was going to sample Fell's special meatloaf. But unfortunately, of course, the meatloaf got mixed up with dog food, and uh, the result was really hilarious. I christen this meatloaf. The Graham Kennedy little signals that Graham was going to use to when he thought that laugh was long enough and I would come in with my line and the first signal uh, was that and then after that particular laugh he uh, he had another signal when it was sort of the end of that particular sequence and he had another little wave like that and it was uh, well have a look at it and see So, I mean, he, he's, his talent is still there, no doubt. His ability is still there, no doubt. But, you know, sadly, he obviously doesn't want to go back on at this present time. But I'd love to see him back on TV. Why are you all looking at me? <laughs> yes. I can't go into my first erotic experience. I can't expand on that. I mean, I remember it as being a very tender, wonderful moment. I, I just wished at the time, remember thinking clearly, I wish I had some company. <laughs> I'd walk a million miles for oh, one of your smiles. My <laughs> mammy. Oh, I've been doing this for so long, I can't tell you. A lady from Wollongong rang earlier tonight asking if that was a mock crow call I made. I don't remember. I mean, you'd know if it was a real one. Yeah. <laughs> you go off air immediately. They come and turn the lights out while you're doing that. Oh, goodness. <laughs> <clears throat> and listen to this. Yes. Why do they say in the beginning of the show, coast to coast, when there is only one continuous coast around Australia? What an F word. <laughs> the um, coast to coast. <coughs> coast to coast means Sydney on this coast, on the on the east, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And uh, all the way to Perth, 
<clears throat> on the west coast, that's coast to coast. Fool. <laughs> Thank God tennis is finished and Graham and Ken are back. At last, Channel 9, who have been deceiving us with recorded sport and all kinds of rubbish and lying to us. Thank God I put that bit in. <laughs> he's a giant. I mean, I, he is... He's one off. He did things that I, I think that even now you hear you, you, the irreverence that you see here sometimes maybe on radio and on an occasional television special with our young comedians. He was doing that and more 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Uh, so how far ahead of his time was he? He knew how to take the boundaries of good and bad taste right to the very, very edge. Many Australians are inclined to use the foreshore late at night at Kirribilli for a progress of a different nature. And there I am with the binoculars. And I think, really, I mean, it's so inconsiderate. My binoculars are too heavy to hold in one hand. <laughs> An Adelaide woman says, <clears throat> the money spent on Graham would be better spent elsewhere. Oh, where? That's debatable. I don't think you watch our credits. If you watched our credits, you'd see this come up from time to time. Much of the money I receive for doing this goes to the Life Education Program to help young Australians lead a better and longer drug-free life. Would you like to see Australian youths live a miserable short life in the gutter? with syringes, you slack-assed Adelaide Tart. <laughs> uh, oh, th is that a late item? Has this been checked? Yes. How many sources? One! Name it! Kumquat! Kumquat. <laughs> That's what you say... <laughs> when you want a quat to come to you. the direction for asking a, a quat <laughs> to, <laughs> to approach you. What else would you say? Come quat, you say? <laughs> the little quat comes up. The tears would come down, which is a family trait, by the way. When we have a belly laugh, the old tears tend to come down. And Graham, in the first few weeks, even in rehearsals, noticed this and, and he used it as a hook. And he used it right throughout that year, but there was a genuine—it was a genuine belly laugh—and it was just more out of, "Wow, you can't say that! You're, you've got to be joking!" And the tears would flow, bring out the tissues, and Graham had this wonderful way of stretching it and stretching it and stretching it and milking the moment for everything it was worth. <laughs> I love it when he cries. <laughs> <laughs> Graham, uh, when he first came in 88, um, shared Ray Martin's dressing room, who was doing midday, and Ray, obviously, the, the uh, station star. Well, when uh, Graham steps onto any television station, he automatically assumes that, not assumes, that I'm the star. So they shared the dressing room, and uh, Ray would have all his personal photographs of people that he'd interviewed over the years up on the wall. But when Graham came in at uh, five o'clock in the afternoon, they came down and Graham's went up. And this went on for about 12 months. And it was quite hilarious. It was a, it was a bit of an arm wrestle in many ways. But it was just Graham being a very naughty boy. Not a naughty boy, but just saying that maybe we really shouldn't all take ourselves too seriously. Uh, but, you know, there's only room for one king on this particular network and I just happened to be it. Graham eventually uh, got his own dressing room, which was down the other end of the hallway and he made sure when he got this new dressing room that when he left the station he didn't have to go by front reception, walk through a studio, walk past anybody. So what he did, he had a door installed in this particular, uh, where we are now actually, where we are now, and he'd just step up from where we are now after he'd had a nice red, walk straight over to this door car and a driver waiting for him and he didn't have to say goodbye to anybody. He loved that. <laughs> Come on down, Sam Sutcliffe! Oh, what a good boy. Sam, Sam. There were things that were accidents. Like the day my dog came to the studio, he invited my dog onto the set. 
Sam, the Labrador. Very well endowed Labrador, I might know, male Sam. And he jumped up on the table on our uh, desk, and Sam, and Sam unfortunately pointed his backside to the camera, and the director at that particular point in time pushed the button, and all you got was Sam's backside, tail up in the air, and everything else was exposed. What a nice picture. Three dogs. <laughs> it's a three-dog night. <laughs> He loves that tennis ball, doesn't he? He does. He's quite frantic about them, actually. Quite stupid, actually, when oh, it comes to tennis not. balls. But he's beautiful. Yeah, he's all right. He's he really good. is. He's a good mate. He's a good mate. So that's, that's <laughs> Sam Sutton. <laughs> we wanted you to meet him. It's just a thrill. Yes, <coughs> that is a nicely framed picture. <laughs> it's Spot Graham Kennedy. <laughs> and that was just an ad-lib moment. But he had a... He had a great way of making everything look pretty natural. Yes, uh, delicious Campbell's tomato soup with just a hint of cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> now. <laughs> that, looks, oh, that looks disgraceful. This is not all that new. I think I've seen this. <laughs> this is a, uh, a Breville uh, something, a massager, which is not all that new but I just wanted to play with one and uh, I think it's terrific. Just think for the first time, Ken, yes. uh, a, a portable massage parlour and when you're finished you don't have to pay the $100 for one with a lot. You simply <laughs> do that. I think it's fantastic. We'll Not as cheap it. as... Oh. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, goodness. Oh, it's fallen into my lap. Oh, good night. Munson and a Ken. very successful mother tour. Lovely. Yeah. Ironically enough, Ken was staying with me in the United States at the time that he got the call. He was covering a big sports story in America. And he got this call saying, Graham Kennedy's going to start a late night news program and he needs a straight man and he's picked you for the job. And Ken, of course, having grown up in Sydney, wasn't really aware as I was of the Graham Kennedy history. And I said, Ken, you've got to go for this because this guy is huge and for him to come out of retirement to do a late night news program, is going to rock the socks off everybody. And I caution Ken, the only thing you have to watch out for, mate, is make sure you don't end up his punching bag. <laughs> Guess who ended up his punching bag? I think you just got out of California at the right time. You know, there were a few tremors while I was there, and you kind of, you know, it just doesn't bother you after a while. Well, that's good. It's one thing you don't have to worry about here, Zon. been initiated into coast to coast until <laughs> until you've sung the chum song a one a two a three a four a five being the chum she's beautiful that's what i be one always happy always happy happy here happy there everywhere so he's got to get around right. that's wonderful one. that's just one that's and that's everybody one. then be knowing that you did chum 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 oh, beautiful. <laughs> The Easter egg routine, Graham has, uh, has very kindly called one of his greatest moments in comedy, and I feel very flattered about that. At Greek Easter, I gave Graham some of my mother's <laughs> Greek shortbreads, which is something that you do. Hmm? I've never tasted anything like it. I'm glad you like them. I don't like it, I just have never tasted it. <laughs> with the shortbreads come the, the hard-boiled okay. red eggs, and Graham asked, what do you do with these red eggs? And I explained that families during the Greek Easter what? feast sit around a table and smash the eggs and at the end of all the well, smashing this, one egg smash remains unscathed and according to the tradition that brings that person good luck for a year. One, two, three. I, I don't think mine. <laughs> yeah. oh, right. Look, it's oh, there's, it's everywhere. Oh, look, there's a bit of this. <laughs> oh, there's a nasty bit. Of... <laughs> oh, look. 
most of those magical moments that you saw at the set were not only carefully constructed but, but very well rehearsed in Graham's dressing room every night before we went on stage. Oh, it's, it's, it's like when we're home, isn't it? <laughs> have, now, you, have you just tuned you you in, folks? <laughs> this is a news program. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the most beautiful no, part about working with him was that you could hear the tag to the same gag ten times in rehearsal in his dressing room, get out into the studio in front of an audience, and it would come out just that little bit different. And uh, a lot of the times those tears of laughter from me were very, very real because I knew what was coming, and yet he'd still deliver it in a way that made it sound like you were hearing it for the first time. Noah went to the top of the mountain and said in a loud voice, Lord! <laughs> Lord? <laughs> Lord! <laughs> Noah went to... No, not him. <laughs> Noah went to the top of the mountain. Noah from the... Biblical Noah from the Old Testament went to the top of the mountain and he said in a loud voice <laughs> Lord there's a flood coming should I build an ark? <laughs> and do you know what? Noah didn't do live television for a long time Say you've had a few drinks, and you just you've got it all. You know, you're going like that, and you go like this. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> My God, these are something you slip on, and uh, they wouldn't recycle them because, uh, well, you wouldn't. I think you're meant to take them, don't you? I've got another one. Look, I'll show you. <laughs> you really like <laughs> Truly, don't you like <laughs> Well, I'm not crazy about it, but I think you might have shoved one of them down the front of your jocks. <laughs> oh, no. I tell you, that's, that's snow. <laughs> it's more of that. The Greek word for an envelope is fakilo. And such is Graham's comedic mind, rather than do the obvious gag and ask me one night over the desk, John, what's the, what's the Greek word for envelope? He, was, he started working on a routine and the routine was in an office and what if I need to borrow a pencil which became his famous molivi and he'd hold it up. And what's, what's the Greek word for paper, hardi? And then the tag would be, well, what if I want an envelope? Molivi? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure Olivia's not dirty for some No, it's not dirty. <laughs> I've picked up, if you've just tuned in, look at my Malivi. <laughs> no? I think it's dirty. It's, <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not dirty. Why do they look? Because, right, I have picked up my Malivi. <laughs> so I've written with the Malivi on the high tea. Now pass me an envelope. Fuck you, Lord. All right, I'll get it myself. <laughs> Mr. Kennedy would like to see you, Mr. Knight. Graham. <laughs> come in, come in. How nice to see you. <laughs> Any little problem, my door's always open. Come in, sit down. Make yourself comfortable. Thank you. Now. Well, I, I, I don't quite know how to put this. Nothing to do with money, is it? No, I don't bother about money, Max. Harry does all that. Now, you see, everybody considers me a Tonight Show compare, a song and dance man, or just a very entertaining person. Which I am, of course. Well, what I'd really like to do, it's a secret ambition, is a bit of straight acting. It isn't easy to cast a funny little bloke like Graham 
with wildly protuberant eyes. You know, there's not a lot of parts for people like this, but there was a part in Don's party. Philip Adams suggested him for a major role because I'd been living in England for years and I must have been the only person who was actually resident in Australia at that time and never heard of him. Little did they realise that had I got away with what I wanted to do, there would have been a great number of television people in the film. I negotiated forever with, um, with Paul Hogan to play a major part as Cooley. But uh, the only one that got through was Graham. Who's this uh, gorgeous woman? Jody. <laughs> oh, and Simon. That's uh, Mac. Uh, sorry about the wife. <laughs> Shit, I'm not. Look. <laughs> <laughs> Took it myself. Who is it? My wife. You wouldn't pick her for a librarian, would you? <laughs> then he suddenly said to me, well, Bruce, when are you going to tell me how to do it? I said, how to do what? And he said, how to act. And he said, we go through it all, but you're not saying anything. I said, but Graham, you're doing it. I said, really, delivering the lines convincingly is all that it needs. I said, if I feel there's something wrong, I'll say so. But there's no magic formula. I can't wave a wand and you'll suddenly be something other than what you are. And what you are is fine for the role. And he said, you mean I'm acting already? And I said, yes, you're acting and you're very good. Here I am, the duck hunter, wading through the shallows. Wading, 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 wading. wading. <laughs> Oof, itching for a duck. Wading, wading. Oh, all of a sudden. Oh, nature calls. <laughs> you sure you want to hear this? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it leaves a nasty taste. Bruce Beresford said, well, what is this? You've mentioned this duck joke. What is the duck joke? Because it's just mentioned in the play and never done. And I told Bruce the duck joke, but said, for heaven's sake, don't put it in the film. It's just too crude. But Bruce loved that sort of humour, and he said, no, that is going right in the film. The interesting thing was that when the film was released and shown all over the world, Kennedy's performance was invariably singled out by critics who had no idea who the hell he was. So it wasn't in any sense television dependent. They said, who is this guy? Gosh, he's good. And he was. Don's party and the club were both ensemble movies and it was essential the actors blended and appeared to know one another very well and that the performances were unified. That's, in fact, I feel was the main thing a director has to do in films is to make sure everyone's acting in the same movie. Graham seemed to me to fit in extremely well. Do you remember the day you played your, your first game? Of course. You'd just turned 17 three days before, or was it 18? 17. It was quite an extraordinary feeling, right round the ground. We all knew we'd come to see the first game of a great new champion. By God, you didn't disappoint us. Do you remember your first kick? Not all that well. Ah, oh, it was magic. I was standing on almost this, yes, this exact same spot. And I can see it as clearly as if it was a video replay. You read, you read the play and started sprinting for the goal. Picked up a long, low pass from Wally Baker. Did a beautiful blind turn around Stan Jackson and slammed it through the centre. He was used to being treated uh with considerably more dignity in the world of television where he had his own quarters, his own dressing room, his own you know, private bathroom. And he found himself in this world that was supposed to be the glamorous world of film. And six of us sitting in the gutter waiting for someone to come and pick us up to take us to the next location. And he said, this is pretty glamorous, isn't it, Jack? <laughs> Here he was, the king, sitting down there with the rest of us. I think Graham's boardroom scene is the other great scene he does in the club. Uh, 
where he finally realises that the dark forces of the, of the club have manoeuvred him and he has to resign. And it's a very moving scene. A lot of people um, report that they get tears in their eyes seeing him um, leave the club. You've served your purpose, Ted. They don't need you anymore. If they didn't need me, they'd sack me too. Well, no one's going to sack me. I've just resigned. Oh, I'm sorry this has happened, Ted. You have been a good president, and it certainly won't be forgotten. You fought to get me my job here, and I... I won't forget that either. I just hope that I can go on and do justice to the faith that you showed in me. I'm sure you will. Well, I, I hope that you and young Jeff sort out your differences, Laurie. I doubt if I'll ever be dashing off $10,000 checks again. I'd like to think that my money was well spent. Yes, so would I. Do you know, do you know what I thought was the, the best game of football you ever played? The day you took on Dick Turner in 62. Mind you, I, I think he just shaded you by a whisker. There was a lot of people who don't. It was, it was like two magicians trying to I'll do one, and Well, I think everyone got their two bobs with. Four days we've been in this zoo. Haven't seen a bloody thing. I hope something happens before five o'clock, Harry. I'm taking a bird out to dinner. Bloody hard to get a cab at that time of the night, too. I don't think he'd done anything like it before. I mean, having to, you know, get dressed up in all the um, SAS clobber and SLRs and the rifles, and we we put him through through a week of, of, of training with the with the commandos up on North Head, and uh, uh, you know, it was, it was even for me, and I wasn't doing anything. It was quite a challenge. One of the most difficult scenes for Graham was probably the one where he's standing at the in the lines and he talks about his previous life. How uh, come you joined the army? My wife, I left her. Oh, didn't realise, sorry. So am I, Bill. What happened, Harry? Well, I got married with the idea of settling down and looking after the woman. I said to myself, Here's one that's different. Here's one I can really do the right thing by. And after about ten months of marriage, she starts ringing up, saying she's working later. An old girlfriend's dropped into town. Or... Getting it out of a couple other bikes, was she? No, I don't think so. It seems she just didn't want to be with me. Shit! Yeah, that's what I thought, Bill. Anyway, one Friday night she rings up. It was our anniversary. And says she's been invited out by some people she works with. Didn't you ask her if you'd been invited as well? Yes, but she said they weren't my sort of people. I wasn't the type that'd fit in with them. She came home about three o'clock in the morning. Rotten drunk. Collapsed on the couch and went to sleep. What'd you do then, Harry? Give her a screw? I packed a suitcase and stood at the end of the couch. I prayed that she'd wake up and say that she was sorry. Anyway, she didn't. So after about an hour, I kissed her on the forehead, told her that I loved her, walked out the door, joined the army the next day, and here I am. I'll be buggy. Yes, I was, well and truly. Well and truly. 
That was an interesting day. He had a lot of trouble with that spe difficult speech. I think about a page and a half, two pages long, complex. Uh, the other the other soldiers all gathered around him, and uh, he seemed to lose confidence with it uh, a number of times. And we were fascinated. The the actors uh, that a man with such you know stage presence and such a, a history of doing routines and uh, would actually lose confidence and start to forget it. So there was a lot of uh, what we call in the theatre side coaching going on. We would take him aside and cajole him. You can do this, Graham. You can do it. Something that I'd never done before until. I did did do the odd angry shot were the action scenes and the and the and the particularly the fight scene. Where, where, and Graham had a lot of fun doing that too. It was the first movie in which I got to punch someone. Now watch me punch Grant Page now as he turns around. Bong. Now all stunt work is is very safe, a bit carefully rehearsed. Now I was on my mark, mm -hmm. but Grant Page at the end was off his and walked in a, just a fraction too close. I mean, I really flattened it, <laughs> which is unlike me to flatten. Look, wallop, I did, I truly, that, that is me. I really flattened him. And there I was, the little tough corporal, until Tom Jeffrey, the director, called Cut, and I went over, threw myself on Grant, screaming, oh, darling, Grant, what have I done? I'm sorry. <laughs> and which looked a bit funny in front of the people. Is Travelling North a good film? Michael, I think so. I can't be objective because I sit there in the dark, trembling with apprehension until I come on. I'm waiting for me to come on. Then I come on and I'm so appalled, I can't concentrate on the rest of the, the movie or the story or how it's being presented. But the word around is that it's good. I think it must be good. Explain the film clip we are about to see. Oh, Mike, do we have to have the film clip? I loathe the process of the actor coming on the show, presenting his film clip, which is not long enough. It's not a long enough segment to explain the film. In fact, by playing the clip, one can do more harm than good. Let's not have the... OK, no film clip. I'll go on. Oh, please. So, cheer up. You're not on your own after all. <laughs> what a surprise. Do you, uh, do you live over there by yourself, Freddie? Yeah, it was ever since I uh, lost the wife about eight years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was a happy marriage. Blameless life, snuffed out like a candle. Makes you wonder. Still, let's not be morbid. I thought Graham in Travelling North was just terrific. I think he captured every quality of that man next door we hope we don't have as a neighbour, then finally, eventually realise is the very best sort of neighbour to have. And um, Graham took us through that transition with great skill, great warmth and um, great humanity. Oh, you've got to have a barbie. Everyone up here has a barbie. It's compulsory to have a barbie. It's very kind of you, Freddie. We really wouldn't want to put you to all that trouble. Oh, it's no trouble. No, I enjoy building things. I've got a plan of it drawn up already. So did you work strictly to plan? Funnily enough, no. No, I just sort of... Let it go, and out it came, straight out of my head. Freddie Francis and I feel it's got a strange, haunting quality. There's something of the druid about it, or perhaps it's Aztec. We think it's got enormous potential. It's the focal point for the start of a brand new religion. <laughs> You're having me on. Really struck me for a man who had all of that behind him. There was a wonderful modesty. There was always a, uh, a slight lack of confidence that gave an edge to his performance. Uh, I, d I don't mean that he was not confident, but there was this sense of uncertainty that I think you get in a lot of very good performers. Graham got in touch with us and said he wanted, he wanted to buy a property where he could um, hug a Clydesdale so we found Graham a property up near us and on it he put his Clydesdale called Dave and he got a lovely golden retriever called Henry. So uh, that's how he lived in this wonderful little cottage. But he also found out that I had a really good uh, greengrocer and uh, he went into Burrowang to the butcher and to the greengrocer one day and as he was buying some, some goods in the greengrocer's shop a woman came in with her friend and she said, uh, that's Graham Kennedy, isn't it? And the person working in the shop said, yes, yes, yes. Does he come all this way to buy his vegetables? And she said, yes, 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 he does. 
Isn't that amazing? He lives in Melbourne. <laughs> and just up the road at the butcher shop on the very first day that he ever went in there to buy some meat, one of the butchers ran into the greengrocer's shop and said, oh, you'll never guess who's just been in here, Bert Newton. <laughs> If I get asked one question still, all of these years later, uh, it's, hi John, how's Graham, when's he coming back on TV? And I have to say to people in the supermarket or at restaurants, look, he's great, but uh, he doesn't want to be on TV anymore. And people see that as a great tragedy. It's not for Graham, because he's doing, I guess, what we all wish we could do, and that is retire early and enjoy life on a farm. There's never been another Graham. There have been a few attempts. And people have even tried to be a modern Graham. People have even tried to be a modern version. Don't ask me to name names, but I've, I've watched it. I've watched it develop. But there just hasn't been another one, and I doubt there ever will be another one. Nobody could be a second Graham. He's entertained us for 30, 40 years. Why shouldn't he just have a rest and have a good time? But you get the sense in the, the public record utterances, the many faxes that have been sent, that, that, that it might all be a, a kind of elaborate joke as well. Uh, that he, here he is saying, look, I've done all this. I made you laugh. You know, I did these fantastic things. You don't know what I might have done if I'd kept doing it. And you'll never know, and I'm never going to tell you. I wish he was in the show tomorrow. I think that Graham's retreat, his Garbo-like retreat to... Uh, to mysterious isolation is a tragedy. Um, and as a, a long-standing Graham Kennedy fan, please come back. He is very private, and there's nothing wrong with that um, at all. And people, when people are tearing pieces off your flesh on a daily basis, if you're on daily television, and you're giving everything you've got, that's really hard, and so, I think it's understandable, but although I do believe that still, because he's not very old, he has an enormous amount to offer television, and he would find it rewarding for himself. Not nightly television, but to do some stuff. If he ever does that, I would hope that he would ask me to make the deal for it, because it would be a great one for both of us. The king of television. Uh, in the first days, first years of television, people, people over 40 now will remember him as being Mr. Television. I mean, television was Graham Kennedy in those days. If there was somebody out there for, uh, for some godforsaken reason who didn't enjoy Graham Kennedy's work, the one thing he or she would have to concede was that he's so unique and what he did in those early days and for later years, he broke the mould of, of a stereotype television programme. moment sweet again We won't say goodnight Until the last minute I'll hold out my hand My heart will be in it on a stream So love me tonight Tomorrow was made for some Tomorrow may never, never come for